when it comes to impedance matching, multiple techniques are in common use, each with its own benefits and limitations. When choosing one method over another, the general parameters to consider are the size and necessary materials, as well as the losses presented by the matching circuit. So hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about the impedance matching by looking at a method similar to the quarter wavelength transformer, but using a structure that's only a sixth of a wavelength long. It's still a narrow band matching technique, but it does offer some interesting advantages. You'll find references to it as either a 12 wavelength transformer, a alternating transformer, or by the name of its inventor, the Bramham transformer. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So let's start with a quick reminder. The quarter wavelength matching transformer is built by using a piece of transmission line of impedance equal to the square root of the two interconnecting lines. And the matching works for resistive impedances only, and it's centered around the frequency where the matching element's electrical length is a quarter wavelength. This works based on the reflection coefficients of the structure. Now, this sort of structure can be built quite nicely on a printed circuit board, where you can make any line impedance you want, but when working with cables, it's quite problematic since you rarely have the right characteristic impedance value. The 12 wavelength transformer, on the other hand, is built from two different segments, each approximately a 12th of a wavelength long, so it's a sixth of a wavelength in total, but the interesting feature is that these segments need to be of impedances equal to the connected impedances. So you don't need some fancy new impedance value, you can simply work with the materials that you already have. Now, just one thing to mention regarding this is that the actual segment lengths are not exactly a 12th of a wavelength long, but rather there is a rather complicated formula to determine the correct value. So if you're under numbers, the lengths are actually shorter the larger the impedance mismatch is. However, even if you do get the numbers wrong, the transformer will still work, it's just that the matching will occur at a frequency which is different than the one expected. So to test this type of structure out, let's first try it in the circuit simulator. Now as a reference, I built a quarter wavelength transformer that goes from 50 to 100 ohms, and to keep things simple, I consider a frequency where the period is 12 nanoseconds so a frequency of about 83.3 MHz. With this value, it's quite easy to determine the quarter wavelength delay, which is 3 nanoseconds, but also things like the 12th of a period, so 1 nanosecond. Anyway, if we run the circuit and we look at the output of the quarter wavelength transformer, we can observe a peak response appearing on the load. And this, if we check it, is occurring at almost exactly 83.3 MHz. So at least the quarter wavelength transformer is working as expected. Now, if we look at the 12 wavelength transformer, so for this I used two different sections, each one nanosecond long, and the characteristic impedances are the end impedances. So the first section is 100 ohms, the second section is 50 ohms. So it should already be clear that other than using more easily available impedances, you already have the external ones, the sort of transformer is smaller. So we have a total electrical length of two nanoseconds instead of the previous three nanoseconds. So now if we check the response of this circuit, again, this gives us a peak, but just to make it a bit more clear, let's just zoom in a bit. And now what we can observe is that the peak response is not appearing at the exact frequency of interest. So it's appearing a bit lower. Now, the reason for this being is that to construct the transformer, we used exactly a 12th of a wavelength, not the result that we would get from the complicated formula. So if we do apply the formula, we get a length of 0.937 nanoseconds. And sure enough, if we check this circuit, so this is the trace in red, we are getting the peak response at exactly the same frequency as we got it with the quarter wavelength transformer. So to get the best results with this type of structure, you need to apply the formula. Now the ratio of the end impedances 
will not just impact the exact required line lengths, but in a similar fashion to how the quarter wavelength transformer works, it will also impact the useful bandwidth of the transformer. So when talking about bandwidth, the first thing to observe is that the bandwidth of the 12 wavelength transformer is narrower than an equivalent quarter wavelength transformer. So here I have the results zoomed in from our previous simulation. In blue, we have the quarter wavelength transformer and in green, the 12 wavelength transformer. And even though it's not a huge difference, there is a non-negligible amount. Now, the next thing to look at is how different end impedances will affect the result. So for this, I created a set of two transformers that go from either 100 ohms to 50 or from 200 ohms to 50 ohms. And to get the same output amplitude to make things a bit more easy to compare, I changed the input signal a bit. So the first transformer has an amplitude of the square root of 2, 1.4142, whereas the second one has an amplitude of 2. And well, even though both circuits were built for the same operating frequency, the exact electrical lengths are different since they've been designed according to the formula. So that's why I'm using these strange values. Anyway, if we simulate and look at the results, so look at the signal appearing at the end, and we'll zoom in a bit, we can observe that the larger transformation, so the one occurring from 50 to 200 ohms, results in a narrower bandwidth than the smaller transformation occurring from 50 to only 100 ohms. So while in theory you could match any impedances with this technique, the larger the difference between the end impedances will be, the narrower the bandwidth that you get. So after covering most of the properties of such a structure, let's now look at a few practical examples and use cases. There are two specific applications that I found that you might also consider. So the first problem that can be solved with such a structure are power splitters. In case you have a line that needs to split into two different lines, but of the same impedance, you need to do a bit of impedance matching to get this to work without reflections. An example for this would be an antenna array or amplifier power combiners. So one way to solve this problem is to simply interconnect the two lines into a node this will result in a half impedance point, then this can be matched to the initial impedance by using a couple segments. The nice thing about this structure is that the half impedance segment can be built by simply putting two sections of the original line in parallel. So you don't need any new type of transmission line. You can build everything from a single type of cable. So to try this out, I took some coax I had lying around cut three equal pieces, solder two of them in parallel, to one end I put an SMA connector, and to the other, the third line segment, which was terminated with a 25 ohm resistor. So two 51 ohm resistors in parallel. Based on the propagation velocity of the line from the datasheet and the physical length, the structure should provide matching at about 122 megahertz. And if we check this in real life using a VNA, I'm measuring the S11 parameter, expressed as a complex impedance, well, we're not really far off. The resistive transformation is occurring at 118 megahertz. And we're getting very close to the expected value. It's not perfectly 50 ohms, but it's not far off either. Now, when building the structure, I made one assumption. The two lines in parallel have the same propagation velocity as the single line. Based on the exact lines and how precisely they are cut, the two structures can have deviations, so in a more sensitive application, it's best to measure each line piece first to confirm the expected behavior, or if needed, to make corrections. The other problem that can be solved with this sort of transformer is the matching of 75 ohm cable to 50 ohm cable. So most RF and measurement equipment are built for 50 ohms, but good quality 50 ohm cable is not that cheap. However, what is cheap is 75 ohm cable. So one use case you might consider is to use 75 ohm cable to interconnect two distant RF elements, like an antenna and a radio. If the distance is only one meter, there's no real point, but if you're talking about hundreds of meters, the price difference 
between equal performance 75 and 50 ohm cable might make you reconsider. In this case, to get the best results, you will need impedance matching between the two. And this is a good application for the 12 wavelength transformer since you don't need any special components. You only need two pieces of the transmission lines that you're trying to interconnect. Now, when building such a device, it's important to remember that the exact physical lengths of the two cables will normally not be the same. Their electrical lengths are the same, but the physical lengths depend on the specific velocity factor, which is usually different. So when starting to build such a device, you may consider starting off by measuring the exact propagation velocity of the cables. For this, you simply need to cut a known length of cable and connect it to a measurement equipment. But this is where the first problem might show its face. One of the reasons why 75 ohm cable is cheaper than 50 ohm cable is because commonly the outer shield is made of aluminum and you can't really solder aluminum. Was this really a good idea to begin with? Definitely. However, you either need some fancy soldering equipment and materials that can solder aluminum or you go for various connectors and adapters. It is however important to remember that these adapters have a non-negligible length and they would be part of your impedance matching circuit. So you either characterize them very carefully or work at low enough frequencies where a bit of tolerances are acceptable. One way of determining the exact velocity factor of a known length of cable is to measure its impedance using a VNA. If one end is a open circuit, the impedance as seen from the other side will be a short circuit at the frequency at which the cable is a quarter wavelength long. So in this case, a 65 centimeter open-ended 75 ohm cable presents a zero ohm impedance at 93.42 megahertz. Knowing the cable length and this frequency, you can determine the exact velocity factor, which for my cable, is 0 0.8096. Now, while this value is present in the datasheet, it usually is documented with tolerances. So to get the best results, it's better to double check and measure your specific cable. Now, in a similar fashion, I took a similar known length of my 50 ohm cable, again, 65 centimeters, and got the minimal impedance value at 88.54 megahertz. With this, if we run the numbers again, will give us a velocity factor of 0.7673. So now, to create a 12 wavelength matching transformer for a given frequency, let's say 28.8 MHz, the center of the 10 meter band that can match 75 ohm to 50 ohm cables, we need to first calculate the electrical lengths using the fancy formula. So this gives us a value of 0.08148 wavelengths. This then needs to be converted into an electrical length at the frequency of interest, thus yielding 0.848 meters. From this, we can now determine the cable length needed using the velocity factors that were measured. And after a bit of calculation, we can say that the structure needed is the following. A 68.7 centimeter section of 75 ohm cable with a 65.1 centimeter section of 50 ohm cable. Let's see if this holds true. So, after measuring the required lengths of cable and interconnecting them, and adding a few zip ties, I came up with this thing. So, on the one end, I have a BST connector to which a 75 ohm termination is connected. This goes through the 65 centimeters of 50 ohm cable. Then, I have an F connector, and from this, I transition to the 75 ohm cable, about 68 centimeters of it. And at the end of this is another F connector, from which I go to an SMA through an adapter. And now to test this out, I connected the structure to the VNA. So if we now check the impedance, as seen from the 50 ohm side, sure enough, at around 28 megahertz, it presents the expected value very close to 50 ohms. This is even clearer on an SWR chart, where we get an almost perfect value of 1. So even with the tolerances introduced by the adapters and the connectors, this thing is working quite well. In the end, the 12 wavelength impedance matching transformer is a functional and practical solution to the issue of impedance matching. 
It can be used either with cables or built on small printed circuit boards and provides the major advantages that no special impedance values are needed and it can be made quite compact. So with that said, hope you enjoyed this video and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.